Welcome everybody. My name is Marcus DiBernardo and what I'm going to bring to you today is a video on positional play. Basically, what is positional play? And I'm going to attempt to make this easy for everybody to understand. I'm going to start off with a slideshow, then I'm going to get into a video presentation of positional play with my own team. And then I'm going to go through how you could take your current training exercises, your current possession exercises, and transform them into positional exercises. And also, what is the difference between positional exercises and possession exercises? And does it really matter that much? We're going to talk about that as well. So let's start off right with this is positional play. What exactly is the purpose of it, right? And the purpose is to score goals, but you're looking to create superiorities in numerous areas. And I gave you four areas right here. So superiorities in speed, in numbers, in player positioning, and in skill sets slash maybe matchups. So in each of these areas, how do we take advantage and create these superiorities? And I'm doing a slideshow here. I'm sharing my screen. It might not be perfect. This is my first time using this program. So we look at the first one, which is speed. So as we see this, it's how do we interpret this? So it could be a center striker, whatever it is, um, could timing his run. So when the ball comes through, he's already on his run full speed where the two center backs are standing still, and that's a, a speed difference. That's a superiority of speed. You're going to see that in a lot of the clips that I show you today. You're also looking for, say, you know, you, you have Sterling out wide, you, you have all these fast players out wide, and those one-on-one -on -one matchups, what happens if the defender is slow? So that's, that's a speed thing as well. And we also talk about speed, like the, how fast we move the ball. So superiority number one that we're speaking about is speed. How do we create these superiorities? One of them would be obviously to match up real fast wingers against um, outside backs who aren't so fast. Number two, superiority in numbers, right? So we... I'll talk about how we split the, the field into zones in positional play, but superiority in numbers is having a one extra player or two extra players than the opponent. And how do we create these sort of superiorities in the field? And obviously if we attract, if we knock this ball around and we attract defenders, it opens up other areas of the field where we'll have an advantage. Next, superiority number three is positioning. So when we talk about positioning, can we get players in between the lines? Can we get them in a situation, and you'll again see this in a lot of the video, where they're receiving in between the defensive lines, they're able to receive that ball in the half turn, with the proper body orientation, and then they can really pen hit the penetrating balls and they can really start to break down um, the defense. So that's a superiority, playing in between players and playing in between lines. It makes it very difficult for the defending team, and obviously that is a major superiority. Next, we have superiority in skill sets. So... Again, we kind of touched on this with speed. Can we isolate a skillful player against a player who's maybe not as skillful? Um, can we utilize a six foot five center uh, striker um, against five ten defender? That is, it's a physical difference. It's a skill set. Peter Crouch, obviously, balls thrown into the you know crossed into the box. Can we create these type of superiorities? So those are four of the superiorities that we look to create in positional play. Now, getting right to the heart of positional play, we're going to break down the field into three zones. Zone number one is a build-up zone. 
And the team in possession, the team, if it's if it's your team's goal kick, the team whose goal kick it is, is is going to have more numbers in zone one, the buildup zone, than the defending team. The reason for this is often because of the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper is the free man. If it's a say a 4-3-3 playing against the back four and a goalkeeper, it's going to be five against three advantage for the team building up in zone one. Zone two is called the progression zone. And this is where the highest number of players are. It's a lot of pressure. That's the middle part of the field. And zone two is where we like to get the ball and we like to attract players and then switch the field. Zone three, also called the finalization zone. And this is where the attacking team is not going to have an advantage in numbers. Normally, they're minus one. If you can get players forward, maybe you can equal out and have equal numbers um, in zone three. But we're looking for 1v1s. We're looking for 2v1s. We're, we're looking for one-touch play on top of the box. All these different types of, of ideas we're looking for in zone three. And again, in, in zone two, maybe we're looking to add an extra man in one area of zone two to maybe attract the defense and then switch the field. So there's different theories. There's there's different um, ideas in each zone that in positional play you want to stress to your team. So we're going to take a look at now. Well, I spoke about this a little bit. So in zone one, can we find the free player, right? And Often finding the free player, that's going to mean moving that ball from side to side. Zone two, as we already mentioned, can we invite pressure, play inside, then eventually can we switch the field? Zone three, we talked about 1v1, 2v1, all these types of situations in zone three. Here's some general ideas about positional play. Um, one is... Can we adapt our tactics to, to fit who we're playing? We never want to stop moving the ball. When I say adapt the tactics to fit who we're playing, well, what if one team is dropped off? Obviously, we're going to have a little different tactics than if a team's going to press us with five players. We're going to try to break that first line of pressure, get in between the lines, and then play for there. Never stop moving the ball forward. Um, I'm sorry, never stop moving the ball from side to side. So eventually we could find our way forward. Body orientation is, is a big, big thing. Um, body orientation is obviously how we receive the ball. The more we could receive the ball on the half turn with the head up, the better chance we have, obviously, to play forward. So head up, half turned is a big deal. Now, also... We also want to think about if you can't receive the ball on the half turn, do you just play the, fa the play the way that you're facing? Because one of the main priorities is that in positional play, we always keep the ball. We don't want to give away the ball needlessly. We're going to work this ball until an opportunity presents itself. So those are some of the general ideas. Um, positional play versus possession. Um, what I'll say about this is positional play. Anytime you do positional play, there's a there's an architecture, there's a structure to the way your players are positioned on the field. When you're just playing possession, people might say it's a little chaotic and that there's not that distinct structure. Uh, structure. I might be a little different and say that I think that players will eventually figure it out and start to self-organize if they're good enough players and they're going to to add structure to their possession exercises. Now, my take on positional play, I personally have kind of a hybrid model on positional play where normal positional play, you're going to play, you're going to build as a team from zone one where you have plus one or two players, build into zone two where the numbers are more or less equal but you look to have a numerical advantage in zone two by pulling an extra man in and then maybe switching the field. 
once you get into zone three, then your, your team travels forward as an entire unit. And then once you're in zone three, you look to work that ball until you can find a way to penetrate. And however you do that, again, if you look at Man City, you know, Sterling goes 1v1. He does extremely well. There's a lot of players in the league that do well like that when they're isolated one-on-one. -on -one. Um, maybe you're looking to get the ball into the box again to a tall forward. Maybe you're looking one touch play on top of the box, but the ball is always circulating, constantly moving that ball to move the defense to open up gaps to play through. Now, the reason why I say a hybrid model for me, because positional play, I often think that whatever the opponent, if the opponent's going to try to squeeze us, and they're 60 yards, 50 yards behind the, the defensive line, and we have fast wingers or a fast striker, why do I need to build up from zone one to zone two to zone three? Why can't I go from zone one, 60-yard ball, to zone three when I know it's a foot race and I know we're going to win it because our superiority might be speed um, in one of those matches matchups? So... In the hunt for superiorities, I personally would not want to be constricted by just a, a pure traditional positional play model where we have to work out of the back. So even working out of the back, I often feel that teams are able to scout you and they're able to work all week on specific pressing off of a goal kick. And at that point, it becomes difficult to work the ball out of the back. So why not just hit a second line ball, bypassing that pressure, and then we play? I'm not saying you have to do it every single time, but I wouldn't be um, so stuck on positional play where you have to work out of the back. And you could see these changes in Guardiola. Guardiola used to work out of the back every single time. Now. It is not the case. He is he has really bent the rules of positional play, what Barcelona did to what he's doing with Man City now. The other thing that I would say is is sometimes teams really play a strict positional play model where they move from zone to zone as a team because they have zero speed. And I, I would say you could look at Barcelona against Liverpool last year when they played their game where Liverpool won by like four goals. There was no way that Barcelona was ever going to hit a ball in and behind Liverpool and win a foot race. That becomes very restricting at that point. And now you need your whole team to move up through the zones in order to create goals. And obviously, if you lose the ball in the attacking third, you need to press and press and press. So depending on your personnel really depends on your interpretations of positional play. So... What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share with you my personal team and how we institute positional play. I'll try to talk you through these videos as we as we start this. So I'm going to share with you now. Let me try to pull this up. This is zone play through zones one, two, and three. So here we have. Notice body orientation of the players receiving the ball. Can they get forward? Can they look forward? My team is here in gray. Right now, we didn't have a, a defensive center mid who was checking in there. That was kind of an issue there. But again, we're building out of zone one here, being patient. Here eventually we get now we go into zone two. Once in zone two, we look to switch the field where there are no defenders. This is now my team in white, already in zone two. Again, being patient, you notice in between the lines there that player was. Probing forward, can't get forward, has to turn back. No problem. As we keep the ball moving, to keep the defense moving, splits two players with one pass in between the lines right there. Again, 
zones one, two, and three here. Starting in zone one, he faked out the cameraman there. And here we go. That's a long ball from zone one to zone three. And you could see how that ended up. That was actually rather good. So I'm going to share with you now. I have three videos on positional play for you guys right now. Share with you video two. So here's video two. This is zone three. So here we are in zone three. We're going to probe. Spaces out wide. Can we get that ball back through? We did. Results on a shot and goal, which was really good. Starting zone one, getting to zone two here. Nice and patient. My team's in blue. We look in between the lines. You see the player was open there in between the lines. Immediately, we saw that switching the field out wide results in a goal right there. Switch of the field right here, and we see we have that 1v1 matchup that we wanted. Into the box and finish. One more video for you here. This will be the last playing video. Then I'm going to give you some examples of training. So that was the goalkeeper who bypassed playing out of the back, played directly deep into zone two, and we, we, we transferred that ball out wide. One touch play on top of the box. I'm not sure how well you could see that, but that's part of our game model, fast area on top of the box. Zones two and three, this player here has a very unique skill set. I allow him to use his skill set very fast, great dribble with the ball. There we are. We have a positional advantage in and behind there to the striker. This is zone two and three in between the lines there. And there we had an advantage right there. Again, zones two and three. Always keep this ball moving. Again, notice the body position, body orientation. Receives the ball on the half turn, opening up the hips, correct body orientation. There the player was in space, plays in and behind. Striker was already running. There's that speed superiority. Playing to attract on the ball, play short, play short, and then play out wide. Zone three, this is really smart. Play in, back heel, and ends up with a shot on goal. Again, body orientation turns him really well. Play, play, plays it out wide there, where it's eventually going to be a goal. Let me share next. I'm going to share with you a little training ideas here. So this is positional play. Oh, hold on one sec. Let me get that going. Here is positional play. This is a training session. We have two, two outside backs, center back, two center mid, well, three center mids, one's in the middle there. And then we switch it to the other side. The backs go up, the two center mids go, and the one in the middle just simply turns around. Very, very distinct roles in this exercise. Now we have another exercise, which is 77 plus two and two goalkeepers, but we don't score. The goalkeepers only use their feet, and you don't actually score on the goals. There's many different ways to do this, multiple ways to change this game. And you could have, once you get it to the other side, it's the other team's ball. They have to work it the other way. Or you could actually change and just go back and forth where the team who has possession keeps possession. Um, there, again, there's a lot of different ways you could play this. If you want to just keep this not as positional, 
Do not give the players positions in this. They'll figure it out for themselves and they can free to interchange positions at all different times. And that, that would be a self-organizing activity. And these guys are smart enough to get that done um, compared to rigid, strict uh, positional play. This is a two-touch restriction here. Now, obviously, you could take out the plus players in the middle. You could go from two to one, and then you could get rid of the plus players altogether as well. So in closing, I know that's a short video on positional play. Um, the things that to keep in mind are, what is the other team doing? How good are they? How good are you technically? If your team's really good technically and you could play through pressure, let's do it. Let's get that done and play through pressure. Maybe if it's, if it's a, a very athletic team, maybe you want to start hitting second line balls to start with and then elect to play in zone two, zone three. Um, these things really depend on age groups. If you're ki teaching young kids and you want them to play out of the back all the time, that's fine. Again, the results aren't going to matter that much. Um, for me, I prefer, prefer that hybrid approach. I really want to know where, where are those superiorities that we can exploit, and a speed superiority on a long ball is something that's no problem. I can remember reading Guardiola's book where he took from New Zealand the rugby team because New Zealand was so dominant in possession of the ball. They said teams, sometimes they just wanted to punt the ball 60 yards down the field press on the other team and win it back just so they wouldn't have to work so hard and the other teams wouldn't know what to expect. It's just a different tactic. Um, so for me personally, like I said, I'm not totally 100%. My team has to play very strict, um, traditional positional play, but I really like the ideas um, presented in positional play to play to attract and to switch the field in zone two, to isolate those 1v1s out wide, head up, correct body orientation, play the way you're facing, keep the ball, all those things, look for the new numerical advantage, play in between players, play in between lines. Those things are really good general principles. And for a flexible game model that I run, those principles fit the game model perfectly. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, this is the first one using this software for me. So it's probably not going to be as good as I wanted, but hopefully you enjoyed it anyways. Take care.